This week on Metro Cafe, we go behind the scenes of The Outer Limits and talk to actor Mark Hamill. Body art a la carte. Get the lowdown on the history, culture, and the art of body design. What does it take to make it as a fashion designer? How about lots of talent and a panel of judges? If you thought the stars of Melrose Place have style, wait until you meet their wardrobe consultant. Lit From Within, a CD featuring Canadian female artists coming together for a great cause. And take a look at the works of Canada's own pop art painter, John Ferry. Keeping up with the new wave of television sci-fi thrillers, The Outer Limits is quickly joining the ranks of such TV shows as Star Trek and The X-Files. We're here at the Bridge Studios in Vancouver to bring you behind the scenes to The Outer Limits and also to show you what kind of visual effects are required to put a program of this genre together. Three cans to stick one, eh, Marker? This first human use of the cave system will shoot this institution to the front of the pack in electrocerebral research. The Outer Limits is a Canadian-American co-production syndicated series that's quickly developing a loyal following among viewers. The series is shot entirely in Vancouver and every week it features a new lineup of actors. I think when uh, The Outer Limits was, was a show, it was kind of, uh, TV was more in its infancy than now. Now it's very sophisticated and now they can tell stories that are so technologically compelling that we would watch them, you know. And, and because Outer Limits, along with other shows, doesn't deal in normal rationality, it's always a mystery, so you're always wanting to see how it comes out, because you can't figure it. You know? Actor Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker on the Star Wars trilogy, guest stars on this episode of The Outer Limits. Hamill compares the 90s version to the old original series. I think it distinguished itself, at least in the old version, uh, uh, from Twilight Zone, which was clearly inspired by, to be more uh, monster-oriented, creature-oriented. Uh, ours is a little more subtle. I would say we're actually more in the Twilight Zone area than we are in Outer Limits. The, outer, the, the monster in this is uh, probably man man creating machines and I mean it's a theme that science fiction and fantasy goes back to time and time again you know don't play with mother nature you'll get burned talking about being burned one of the main ingredients to the success of Outer Limits are the visual effects when it comes to virtual reality environment better known in the business as VR environment this particular episode is worth seeing this episode is called mind over matter and what a lot of it's about is uh, a VR environment We've got uh, characters who go into a lab and there's a computer that can read their thoughts and project it on a screen. The computer also takes their virtual presence and puts them in these environments. The challenge in this show wasn't really coming up with something interesting looking because that's almost a given. What we had to do was get it done between when we shot the live action and when we played it back in the lab. The, that's part of the, the, the fun of television is that we had three days to shoot on location, then we had the weekend, and now we're in the lab, so we had to treat all of this video over the weekend in order to have it ready for the playback days. Some of the visual effects in The Outer Limits are done on the Flame System at Northwest Imaging and Effects in Vancouver. One of the main things Flame System can do is eliminate the need for stunt people to do a lot of life-threatening scenes. The software is called Flame and it really opens up pretty much every avenue. There's, there's very few limits um, to what can be done. So it's kind of a neat tool. It really it, it broadens the horizons like you can't imagine. In this case, I guess the idea is that uh, this woman is sort of an otherworldly kind of entity and she has basically survived this horrific car accident that she's been in with her boyfriend. Um, however, they wanted a little bit of a more dramatic effect than her just walking away from the burning car. They want her walking through a sheet of fire. To achieve the final effect, we took a couple of additional elements, um, the main one of which was this wall of fire, uh, which was shot in a studio. Um, what we have to do is take that fire and mat it into the shot, matching the color to the existing fire off the car, and then bring her through the flames. So the main thing is to get the fire that wasn't in that shot in there and make it look like it belongs and kind of work on the effect of her coming through where she kind of warps the flames there as she comes through. Three here, you take two. D marker. D marker. Playback. Like an assistant back there and then we realize who it is. I'm just trying I like to do that. Introduction. I, 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 there we go. Shh, 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 shh. 
I've done a lot of television. This is by far the most demanding show I've ever done. And you know, usually on a series, you have certain number, a certain number of sets that are already standing, and most of your characters exist from week to week. And we're casting every week, and we're building every week, and it's it's tough. It's an anthology show. I mean, uh, I think it requires more of the audience. I mean, audiences get familiar with a group of characters, and sometimes if the scripts aren't as good, it's okay because they like those people. But in this, you know, they start fresh every single week, and. Uh, you know, uh, I'm exhausted, and these guys have to come back next week and do another one. The Outer Limits currently airs in syndication. Check your local listings. Tattooing started as a ritual thousands of years ago by ancient settlers in Africa. Then it became the body art of choice by a select number of the population in the last 50 years. Nowadays, body art has gone more mainstream and to some people it is a way to relax. If you're relaxed, you actually get put into a very meditative state, you know, combined with the music and then also the meditation on the design you're having put into your skin, which hopefully you've put a lot of thought into. All that combined, you get into a really, really neat uh, kind of tranquil, positive state of mind, and hopefully that's what carries on with the tattoo. Depending on the detail and the artistic design of the art, tattooing can be somewhat painful to some people. But, as Madonna would say, there's a lot of satisfaction in a little bit of pain. Pain, of course, is part of the process. The mark is as important as the process. The pain is simply a symbol, a sacred symbol that, that uh, um, helps release a great deal of tension and anxiety and also uh, it's an endurance thing, it's a, a physical test that uh, forever is marked on their body and they know they've been able to withstand it and that gives people a great deal of courage to to move on. The whole industry has improved. The, the quality of the inks are superior to what they were even five, six years ago. The tattoo machines are constantly um, being re-engineered and improved. The artists themselves, most of them, well a lot of them now are coming from art backgrounds rather than, you know, he, he could draw a little bit so he learns the, the, the trade. There's a new breed of artists that don't call their tattoo studios parlors, they are art studios. They're very much working on a kind of uh, a higher end uh, kind of clientele, which doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend a lot of money, but the people who are coming in are far more discriminating, are much pickier. There's a consultation process that goes on, um, and that's part of the process. And also, for some people, the ritual experience of tattoo is as important as the finished pressure? Does Aaron Spelling ever call you and say, we need more glamour, we need more cleavage? Recently in Toronto, our Metro Cafe cameras were invited down to the Yorkdale Designer of the Year Fashion Gala, where six of Canada's most talented fashion designers competed for this year's prestigious award. It takes a lot of hard work and talent to make it as a successful fashion designer. But the designers in this competition are already established and somewhat recognizable. It was only a matter of going in front of a panel of judges to determine who the winner is. As a, as a Canadian designer, yes. what do you think of the designs that are coming out this year? Colors this year, the colors are very bold and beautiful and it's quite nice. And tonight what they show here too was really great and I love my stuff too. <laughs>
The gala included a fashion fantasy competition where limbo designer Chandra Abdurrahman walked away with the prize. Then came the biggest honor of the evening, the latest collection from designer Marlon Rivera, which earned him the title of Yorkdale Designer of the Year. Yorkdale's Designer of the Year. I feel I feel like we're on top of the world right now because it's so difficult to, to express Canadian fashion in terms of menswear. It's not easily accepted. Menswear buyers looking for they're looking for Italian. They're looking for something that comes out of Europe uh, to get recognition for doing for all the hard work and trying to really promote Canadian fashion and say we're just as good, if not better. Justine Priestley for Metro Cafe. I'm on Melrose Avenue in Los Angeles. If you are a fan of the show Melrose Place and you are at all fashionably inclined, then you want to meet Denise Wingate. She's the costume designer for the show. And she took me shopping and we had a little talk about what it's like to choose the clothes for the hottest show on TV. How much fun is it to have a job where you just have to shop all the time? It can be a lot of fun. It can also be very, very stress frustrating if you're looking for something in particular. If you know you want this certain outfit, let's say you want an orange dress to go for this particular scene so it matches the set. How hard is that to come up with like new clothes and new styles for so many different people and actors and extras and everything? It must be, you must be like just you must have dried up Crazy. LA by now. Where where do you shop? I shop almost everywhere, all over the valley, all over Hollywood, and I have a, a great stock of stuff, too, from Four Seasons. I try to keep it fresh because, uh, as we all know, fashions change so much, and styles come and go, and everything is sort of, you know, you want to stay current, and you want to keep, you want to keep it fresh. Do you feel a lot of pressure? Does Aaron Spelling ever call you and say, we need more glamour, we need more cleavage? No, luckily, um, I, I don't hear from him very often, which to me is a good sign. <laughs> when Mr. Spelling doesn't call you, know you're doing a good job. Right. <laughs> so you're going to take me into a shop and uh, yeah. outfit me? I think we could uh, give you a few outfits, sure. Excellent, let's go. and the gossip. Are there any actresses or actors who are really picky and they may be paranoid about a certain body part and you have to always be really careful with them? Well, I pretty much know everybody's bodies by now. I know what they will and won't wear. I know what I can get away with. Sometimes I'll put something in uh, Heather or Josie's room and they'll just look at me and they'll go, uh-uh. Look who's here. America's favorite homicidal maniac. I think the most fun I'm having this season is with Laura Layton, who plays Sydney, because we're doing sort of a retro late 60s, early 70s look with her. And she's just been such a good sport about it, and she'll try like, anything. And it's been a lot of fun. It just keeps it, you know, keeps it fresh. And she, her character's always changing anyway, so it's a lot of fun. Do you know all the intimate inside leg measurements of all the punks? Yeah. <laughs> Not by heart. There's too many. <laughs> So one thing everyone wants to know is what happens to all those beautiful clothes? A majority of the stuff 
Uh, we resell stuff that have, has already been used. Lit From Within is a compilation CD featuring Canada's highest profile female musical artists and poets. I had a chance to talk to Christy Thursk of the Rose Chronicles and Mae Moore about their involvement with this CD. Whose idea was it to put this compilation disc together? It was a woman by the name of Tony Mariana, who used to be the head of marketing at Network Records. She saw a woman run out of the bushes and um, was trying to wave cars down. She was looking frightened and she was half clothed, etc. And um, something made Tony want to pull over, so she pulled over and the woman um, asked her if she could help her because she'd just been raped. How did you get involved with the CD? I had written a song that was about uh, physical abuse from a, a former lover, and I thought it would be an appropriate contribution to that. Very flattered they asked me. It's, uh, it's an issue that doesn't seem to be going away. The necessity of this CD is to help to raise money for rape crisis centers, which have always <sighs> never, sorry, never had enough uh, funds available to them. And there's so many centers being shut down across the country, and and um, women are constantly marginalized and and uh, shoved to the back when it comes to funding. So I think that this is a very, very important project to be involved with. And I love you, I love you, I love you like never before. Do you think the CD will bring more awareness to the world about this problem? I think there is a general awareness there. Sometimes people just tend to forget and, um, you know, it's just another issue. But it's, it's one that's very important and the fact that women have put this together is a very important aspect of, of the CD. To anyone who might be out there who might be experiencing an abusive relationship or violence in the family, is there anything you'd like to say on a personal note? I think it's really important to um, to speak out about it, to um, share, share that horrible experience and, and get it out of your system and also um, allow people into your life that can help you and um, because there are a lot of people out there, maybe not necessarily friends or family, if uh, people have a difficult time approaching friends and family, there are you know, um, situations set up like, like clinics, like um, centers where there are professional people that you can talk to and, and, uh, and live out that experience and, and um, deal with it properly. And I love you, I love you, I love you like never before. John Ferry is a young, up-and-coming Vancouver artist whose work explodes with love, life, energy and vitality. We're here at the Whip Gallery in Vancouver to take a closer look at the work of this very aware artist. Where do you come up with all these colors and what do they represent to you? My work is about color. 90% of my work is about color. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to do the images that I do. But it never ceases to amaze me the incredible combinations of color and design that we have in our, in our, in our works and especially in my work. I've always been drawn to color. I find that color is about life and love and energy and vitality and that's just what color reads to me.
John Ferry has dedicated his art career to worthy causes and has extensively donated his artwork to endless charities. AIDS, however, remains to be the charity cause most dear to his heart. I believe that AIDS is the greatest cause of our time. I've had 37 friends die of AIDS and I take it very, very seriously. It's hit my life and affected my life a great deal, as I'm sure it has virtually everybody. The way I contributed my, to the cause was through my career and through my artwork. Um, send, loaning my images to a loving spoonful that feeds inbound AIDS patients, doing all the campaigns for AIDS Vancouver, making people aware of what the services that are available in the community are. A lot of people don't know uh, what they can do and what can happen. I, I look at my work that's been created uh, uh, and has been compared to the likes of uh, Keith Haring or Andy Warhol and I'm very flattered by that but I also think well they don't have the market cornered on colors and black lines and things like that. Uh, my work is universally recognized. You don't have to speak another language to recognize my work or understand it. John Ferry has done a lot of traveling and has admired the works of international renowned artists, but one New York travel incident remains vivid in his memory. I am so fascinated finally seeing Maplethorpes and Warhols and Keith Herrings and all these artists that I've studied and admired over the years and I wanted to get up as close as I possibly could and unfortunately my nose brushed against one of the canvases and uh, it set off the alarm. So I was quickly ousted and years ago I was at the, uh, the Sistine Chapel in, in Italy and I was laying on the floor pretending that I was Michelangelo and I guess I broke some cardinal sin and was asked to leave right after that as well. So I've been kicked out of a few museums and it seems to be sort of a trend these days. Next week on Metro Cafe, we catch up with actress Cynthia Dale and talk about her career after Street Legal. Electric skin, do you know what it is? We'll show you what it's all about. From rock videos to cheerleading, choreographer Jocelyn Peden brings it all together. Fresh hot off the set of Showgirls, Gina Rivera tells us about her Hollywood experience. Also, we get up close and personal with members of Soul Asylum, and Benita sneaks backstage and chats with rock group Live.